Saracenia is a genus of 8 to 11 species of North American pitcher plants. The genus belongs to the family Saracenaceae, which also contain the closely allied genera Darlingtonia, or the California pitcher plant, and Heliamphora. All Saracenia trap insects and other prey without the use of moving parts. They're static, unlike a plant like the Venus flytrap, which closes its leaves when they're triggered. Saracenia use a combination of lures, including color, scent, and nectar, and inescapability. The entrances of the trap are one way. Here we see the entrances of the Saracenia trap, and we can see clearly that the structure is very inviting to potential prey. Saracenia are native to the eastern seaboard of the U.S., including Texas, the Great Lakes area, and southeastern Canada, with most species occurring only in the southeast U.S. Only Saracenia purpurea occurs in cold to temperate regions. Saracenia tend to inhabit swamps and grassy plains, characterized by acidic soil, typically made up of sand and sphagnum moss. Frequently, the soil will be poor in nutrients, particularly nitrates, and the soil might be continually leached by moving water or made unavailable to the roots by the low pH of the soil. The plants extract nutrients from insects. They prefer strong, direct sunlight with no shade. Next, I'll consider the mechanics of the trap structure. The Saracenia trumpet, or, or trap portion, attracts insects with secretions from nectaries at the lip of the pitcher leaves, and it also uses a combination of the leaves' color and scent. There is slippery footing at the pitcher's rim, which causes insects to fall inside of the structure, where they die and are digested by the plant using digestive enzymes like proteases. The hard exoskeleton is usually not digested, and by the end of the summer, there can be a hundred uh, insect skeletons in the trap. It might not only be flies, it could be beneficial insects like bees as well. The trap ha is a vertical tube with a hood called an operculum, which extends over its entrance. Below it, at the top of the tube, there's usually a rolled lip called the peristome. This lip secretes nectar and scent. The hood also produces nectar, but in lesser quantities. The inside of the pitcher tube, depending on the species, can be divided into three to five distinguishable zones. Here we'll only discuss four zones because only one Saracenia, Saracenia purpurea, does not uh, have only four zones. Purpurea has five, but it's not been determined exactly what the fifth zone does. It might do nothing, but of course, from an evolutionary perspective, it's very dangerous to make that assertion without having evidence. Zone one is the operculum. In most species, the operculum covers at least part of the pitcher opening, preventing rain from excessively filling the pitcher, which would result in loss of prey and a dilution of the digestive fluid. The operculum also serves as a guide to guide prey to the pitcher opening using a combination of color, scent, and downward pointing hairs. Zone two is the peristome and trap entrance. The peristome produces nectar, which can just be detected by the human nose. This lures insects to land or crawl onto the footing surrounding the pitcher trap. Perhaps insects assume that they are encountering a flower, but of course, there's a surprise waiting for them. This zone includes a waxy upper portion of the tube, and the wax can actually adhere on to the insect's feet, making 
getting footing almost impossible. Zone 3 is right below Zone 2 and features an inside leaf surface, surface with non-existent footing, as well as a coating of ultra-fine downward pointing hairs. Insects that have made it this far lose any chance of escape. This zone is also studded with digestive glands which secrete enzymes into the digestive fluid. Zone 4 is the final zone for most Saracenia species. It is filled with digestive fluids and absorbs nutrients released from the insects by the work of digestive enzymes and bacteria in the pitcher fluid. Of course, other animals can be trapped inside the pitchers, including small vertebrates like tree frogs and lizards. These don't seem to be the intended prey, although they are digested just the same. There are very coarse downward pointing hairs on the inside of the trap, which makes escape from the digestive fluids almost impossible even for a vertebrate. Flowers are produced early in spring with or slightly ahead of the first pitchers. They are held singly on long stems, generally well above the pitcher traps to avoid trapping potential pollinators. The flowers, which depending on species, are 3 to 10 centimeters in diameter. They are dramatic and have an elaborate design which prevents self-pollination. The whole flower is held upside down so that the umbrella-like style catches the pollen dropped by the anthers. The stigmas are located at the tips of the umbrella-like style. The primary pollinators are bees. Bees, searching for nectar, must force their way past one of the stigmas to enter the chamber formed by the style. Inside, they will inevitably come into contact with pollen, both from the hanging anthers and from the pollen collected by the style. Upon exiting, the bees must force their way under one of the flap-like petals. This keeps them away from the stigma and avoids self-pollination. Pitcher production begins at the end of the flowering period in spring and lasts until late autumn. At the end of autumn, the pitchers begin to wither and the plants produce non-carnivorous leaves, phyllodia. These play a role in the economics of this species. The supply of insects during winter is decreased and the onset of cold weather slows the plant metabolism. Putting energy into producing carnivorous leaves or traps would be uneconomical. At the same time, the leaves are useful for generating energy that the plant will put into making new leaves, new traps, at the beginning of the next year. This is a young Saracenia plant, and you can tell because the traps, although they're fully formed and functional, are not as tall and particularly not as broad as the adult traps. There's one exception to this general rule, and that the first trap of the season can be bigger than the traps later on. This can be a little bit confusing sometimes. Saracenia do not self-pollinate, and they require either bees or hand-human-assisted po pollination. Saracenia pollen remains potent for several weeks when refrigerated, and it can be stored by cultivators to use with other Saracenia varieties. All Saracenia hybrids are fertile and will hybridize further. This characteristic allows cultivators to produce a number of variants. Seeds need a period of cold and damp to germinate. Growers can mimic this by placing the seeds in a refrigerator for two to six weeks. Again, as a rule, the Saracenia seeds float so that it's very easy to sow them on the surface of a substrate. They usually germinate when transferred to a warmer, bright condition. Saracenia seedlings all look alike for the first two or three years, 
and the plants reach maturity after four or five years. For most gardeners, division is the most popular method of propagation. Rhizomes produce new crowns of pitchers over the course of a few growing seasons and can be divided and separated during the plant's winter dormancy or early in the growing season. This technique is also used to separate sections of rhizomes that don't have any pitchers, but when repotted, the section usually grows a new crown. Another technique is to encourage new crowns to appear by cutting small notches up to about five millimeters deep into the top of the rhizome. A new crown frequently develops at the site of the notch. Here is a well-established pitcher plant that is in need of division. The soil is a ground peat moss and it can be easily washed off to expose the rhizome. As is clear, there are two or three separate crowns and perhaps the easiest thing to do in this case is to remove the plant from the pot and remove one crown for planting somewhere else. Here one crown has been removed. It's a very small crown and they're very easy to pull off of the main mass. In fact, there's no need for clippers or anything like this. This is a very well-established plant and it can be put somewhere else. What's also clear is that although this plant is several years old, the root mass is not particularly developed. Saracenia do not have uh, bold roots. They have very fine hair-like roots that uh, permeate the very soft, nutrient-poor soil that they normally grow in, which is, in this case, ground sphagnum moss. This afternoon I'd like to discuss some academic papers that are easily available online. Some of them are a few years old and one in particular is relatively recent. One by Stephen Hurd considers capture rates of invertebrate prey by the pitcher plant Saracenia purpurea, particularly from a site in West Newfoundland. Some take-home tidbits from this paper include larger pitchers are better, in other words more effective, at gathering prey than small pitchers. Now that is intuitive. However, somewhat counterintuitively, earlier opening pitchers do not have an advantage over later opening pitchers, which suggests that most of the prey is captured at the end of the season, rather at the beginning of the season. It's also interesting to note that second year pitchers that have decreased nectar production still manage in catching about as much prey as when they were first generated in the first year. So that the garden varieties, uh, they can look even a little bit battered and they produce less uh, nectar as an attractant, they still manage in catching prey. This again is counterintuitive. Herd has uh, extensive results about what is captured, uh, including 12 insect orders. But uh, if we look at his study of 4,780 total captures, Hymenoptera, almost exclusively ants, were the most common at about 33%, followed by Diptera, 33%, Gastropoda, 8% and Coleoptera, 7%. When the captures were broken down by dry mass, Hymenoptera, still dominated by ants, remained the most important at 26% of the total. However, Coleoptera, 23%, and Gastropoda, 20%, were the second and third. Diptera made up only 12% of the captures by mass. The uh, importance of Coleoptera was partly due to occasional captures of very large carabid beetles.
This can be compared to another study in Michigan of a particular taxa that were captured. The dry mass captures in Michigan, the site in Michigan, were 45% Diptera, 20% Orthoptera, and Coleoptera, 13%. Hymenoptera made up only 4%, and gastropods were entirely absent. What is the takeaway from this? The takeaway from this is that, again, somewhat counterintuitively, uh, gastropods, snails and slugs, are, uh, are uh, real prey items of Saracenia, and that in a garden environment, snails and slugs can be removed with pitcher plants. This is, again, somewhat counterintuitive because it would seem from the architecture of a pitcher plant that they would be targeting flying insects in particular. But we also have to remember that ants would have to crawl up the pitcher and drop rather than fly up. So what at first may appear to be a beautifully designed pitcher for flying insects seems much broader than that. The next paper is from 1998. It deals with the efficiency of insect capture by Saracenia purpurea, the northern pitcher plant. It is by Sandra Newell and Anthony Nastase. It considers pitcher plants from a site in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. There are a number of important elements to this paper. In the discussion, I'll read a paragraph. In a natural environment, pitcher plants are not efficient at capturing insect prey. Using the most conservative estimate, the number of prey visits, and counting only the visits on the lip, hood, or inside of the pitcher, the pitcher captured only 2.1% of the potential prey. This low efficiency of capture translates into a relatively low level of nutrient acquisition for the average pitcher. For example, if 68 pitchers were able to capture 27 prey in 136 hours, each pitcher might expect to capture a prey item once every 15 days. A plant with five pitchers might be expected to capture one prey every three days. This is far less than people would have assumed just by uh, looking in a non-scientific way. But of course, with quantification, we can see that the pitchers are not very effective. However, the authors did note something that the pitchers were doing well. And I quote again, most pitcher characteristics did not have a great impact on the number of insects visiting the pitcher. Red veins, however, produce nectar and are UV reflective. These nectaries have long been considered an important attractant. As might be expected, pitchers with more red venation attracted more insects. This makes intuitive sense because if we think that insects are looking at things that the human eye might not be picking up on in particular, something in the ultraviolet range, we would understand that insects are guided to the top of a pitcher by the veins. The authors next consider ants. Ants were the most common visitors on pitcher plants, harvesting nectar from the plant. Perhaps as a function of their ubiquity, ants were also the single most common prey type. Yet the pitcher's efficiency in capturing ants was less than half its efficiency in capturing non-ants. On most of the pitchers, ants were more able to move around the surface of the pitcher without losing their footing. Thus, ants were better than other insects at escaping. We have to remember that the pitcher has a smooth surface, it has hairs, and it also has a coating of wax that would adhere to the insect's foot and would break off. Suddenly, meaning that the insect, if it were inside the pitcher, would plunge to its doom. The authors describe something of the conundrum 
of ants. While the potential for mutualism exists, another scenario is that ants are opportunistically using a resource in their environment and pitcher plants gain little or nothing from the relationship. The low proportion of ant visits ending in capture 0.3% seems to indicate that the plants are paying a high price in nectar for very little return in captured prey. Since pitcher plant nectar contains amino acids, a component of nectar known to attract ants. In other words, ants are harvesting the nectars and are taking things from the plant and they do not have the common courtesy to die. This is an area of evolutionary biology that will no doubt receive much more attention in the future. I'd like to consider as a final paper something published in 2019. It's available on the net, it's in the Scientific Naturalist, and the title is Nature's Pitfall Trap. Salamanders as rich prey for carnivorous plants in a nutrient-poor northern bog ecosystem. The authors are Patrick Muldawan and several others. They're considering a stand of Saracenia purpurea in Canada at Algonquin National Park in particular. It was known that tropical pitcher plants, like of the genus Nepenthes, captured vertebrate prey. These pitchers are very broad, not very deep, and they've been known to capture things like lizards frequently, small bats, all the way up to some birds. However, Saracenia purpurea is a much smaller pitcher. It's in fact the most widely occurring North American pitcher plant, relatively narrow and very deep. The authors found in their particular stand 20% of the trumpets or traps contained spotted salamanders. Many of them had recently morphosed into the adult form. So some were uh, in the larval stage. The question is, what were they doing in the pitchers? The authors suggest that they could have been attracted there by insects, so they could be attracted there for feeding opportunities, or they could have been attracted there from water. It would have required a bit of effort to get into the trap. Now, while there, some of them were making use of their new home and seemed quite vigorous and were feeding. However, many others were dead and were being digested by the gastric juices in the plant. The authors suggest that one salamander would equal three full pitchers with invertebrate prey. Does this suggest that this common pitcher plant targets these salamanders? Perhaps if more detailed studies, uh, perhaps uh, uh, over the entire range of this pitcher plant were conducted, we would know more. But it shows that there is even a lot of new information about very common plants like Saracenia purpurea. The coming decades will be very interesting.